Well, good evening. You guys are looking at the uh, screen. I was trying to figure out. They're not looking at me. No one's paying attention. <laughs> looking at my big face on the video screen. Hi, my name is Jared. It's good to be with you. I hope you're excited to be here this weekend. I want to make a deal with you. Thank you for the lights. Now I can see folks. Uh, I want to make a deal with you. We, we have a limited amount of time together. You've you got a lot of time this weekend um, to get lots of energy out, spend a lot of time with your friends, lots of talking, lots of playing, lots of eating, all that sort of thing. You're going to have late nights where you get to hang out. In the limited amount of time that you and I have together, I want to make a deal with you. If you'll give me your attention for the 35 minutes, maybe a couple of times I'll go a little bit over that. No promises, but around 35 minutes or so in, in the four times that we have together, I promise to do two things. Number one, I want to tell you the truth. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm not a big fan of watering things down. I'm not a big fan of kind of muddying things up. Um, I'm going to speak to you like young adults. Um, I figure if you can learn geometry and calculus and biology and algebra and all sorts of stuff at, at school, you can learn theology at a youth event. Is that okay? Um, for, you know, 35 minutes at a time. You know, it's not going to be like an academic lecture or anything like that. But uh, I might have you stretch just a little bit with some of the language that I use and those sorts of things. But if you'll give me your attention for the short amount of time that we have together, I promise I'll tell you the truth. I won't talk down to you. And uh, more importantly, I promise to hold up the glory of Jesus to the best of my ability for you. It, that's the really the only thing, the only message, the only news that I have that's really worth anything, and it's actually worth eternity. So that's what I want to leave you. Um, I, I'll try to be funny here and there, but I don't have a whole lot of jokes. Uh, I'm not one of those kind of, you know, rah-rah dynamic kind of speaker. So if that's what you're looking for, sorry to disappoint you, but I promise to tell you the truth and to give you Jesus. Is that a deal? Okay, good deal. If you've got uh, your Bibles with you, please turn to Matthew chapter 16. Matthew chapter 16, um, the passage that we're going to be looking at is a, a starting place for us to be looking at the concept of the church, ecclesia, to be called out. Ecclesia is the, the Greek word that's translated um, church in our New Testaments. It essentially means um, an assembly that has been summoned or as the, the tagline of your event is called, it says called out, those who have been called into a gathering together. And the organizers of Impact this year have decided it was important to highlight for you the importance of the church. And so we're going to start at a really important place, some words of Jesus about the church in Matthew 16, uh, beginning in verse 13. But what Jesus is doing here in this passage is setting up the apprehension or um, certain kinds of belief in him. And this isn't anything, um, uh, you know, new. So we see when Jesus asks, who do people say that I am, as we'll see very shortly, like what's the word on the street about me, Jesus, he hears these varying answers. Well, this is what these people say, and this is what these people say, and this is what these people say. We do that today too. We have different versions of, of Jesus or, or um, summations of Jesus or reviews of Jesus that kind of, you know, um, work about in our culture. I made a little list here that maybe we could kind of consider. I gave some different names to the kinds of false Jesuses or fake Jesuses that are very popular in today's culture. The, the first one I'm calling the ATM Jesus. I don't know if any of you guys even use ATMs. You all have Venmo and everything else. But sometimes there were in the, in the, in the olden days and actually in, in the lobby here in the hotel, there's these machines you go put your your bank card in or your credit card in and you push some numbers on this thing and it gives you money that comes out of your account. Well, some people imagine Jesus is like he's the, the supernatural ATM machine. If you just press the right buttons, if you have the right formula, the right password, the right secret code, if you pray hard enough, if you do all the right things, Jesus will give you what you want. Kind of a prosperity gospel sort of Jesus that Jesus exists to just fulfill our wishes and dreams, almost like a, a magic genie might would be another word for that. Um, the other kind of Jesus is the sort of um, hippie peasant philosopher Jesus. And lots of people love, um, for instance, things they think Jesus said 
or even things they, um, that Jesus actually said but taken way out of context. At my church this last year, we preached through the Sermon on the Mount, uh, which we find in Matthew's Gospel, um, primarily uh, beginning in, in chapter 5. And what's really fascinating about the Sermon on the Mount is that's where the most popular um, sayings of Jesus come from. So if you just like stopped anyone on the street, whether they're a Christian or go to church or anything, and you say, hey, do you like Jesus? Most of them will say yes, unless they're just you know, trying to upset you. Even people who don't believe in Jesus will say, yeah, yeah, Jesus was cool. And if you ask them, well, what's something Jesus taught? Nine times out of 10, if they get a right answer, it's something from the Sermon on the Mount. Don't judge lest you be judged. Uh, um, you know, uh, be meek or just something like that. Um, and what's really fascinating, though, when you read through the Sermon on the Mount is you see actually just how difficult the things Jesus is calling us to do are. The Sermon on the Mount is not um, very comforting uh, to people who are trying to do the religious thing. In fact, it's very challenging. It's very convicting. Uh, if you're not following the way of Jesus, actually, it's very condemnatory. It's very damning, actually, because what Jesus is doing is saying um, that we are to do things that it's practically impossible to do apart from him. And what Jesus is doing in the Sermon on the Mount is, is sort of drawing this circle around himself, making himself the center of the universe. So the sort of hippie peasant philosopher Jesus is really um, out of context of who Jesus really is. He wasn't just a guy who went around handing out, you know, little you know, uh, philosophical sayings, little fortune cookie type things. He was a guy who went around saying, if you want life, if you want to live, if you don't want to die, you must follow me. And that's usually not what the hippie peasant philosopher type people like. What about a word speech Jesus? Maybe you've heard a word speech Jesus. You could also call him touchdown Jesus. This is the Jesus that gets mentioned only when somebody succeeds at something. So at the movie awards or the, the music awards, somebody wins an Emmy or a Grammy or an Oscar or something. And they, I, I, I want to thank my Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, right? And it's for something that they, you know, acted in that's like horrible to watch, you know. It's like, it's like it doesn't glorify God at all and yet they're thanking Jesus for it. Or the athlete who mentions Jesus only when he scores the touchdown or only when he wins the game as if Jesus just sort of exists to be the uh, source of gratitude for all of our successes. Getting a little closer to home, maybe some of us don't have the opportunity to have a touchdown or a, a, an award speech Jesus, and certainly we don't believe in a prosperity gospel Jesus, but a lot of us have what we might call Sunday Jesus. Sunday Jesus. This is the Jesus who just sits on the shelf until it's time to be religious. We only think about him or talk to him or mention him when it's time to go to church or when it's time to go to youth group. We don't really think about Jesus other than those Wednesday nights or Sunday mornings or Sunday nights. Is that the kind of Jesus that you're tempted to believe in? We just, of course, celebrated the Christmas season. Sometimes I think we ought to consider the Christmas baby Jesus. He's the Jesus you kind of put in the box and put up in the attic until it's time to think about him, the special occasions. When I was a kid, um, there was a, a, a toy company came out with these little dolls for boys. They're trying to market these dolls to boys called My Buddy. And... Uh, <laughs> But I, I know, like, I'm dating myself. Some of you have no idea who my buddy is. Some of you are old enough. You're Gen Xers, maybe. You remember my buddy. Um, you may not know what my buddy is, but picture, uh, you've probably seen the, the Chucky doll. You know Chucky? Okay, all right. Chucky's actually modeled after the my buddy concept, not the horror part, but, like, he's a little boy's friend. He's the pal. He's the, and then, of course, he turns evil. But the my buddy wasn't supposed to turn evil. He's just supposed to be your buddy, and he follows you wherever you go, and he, he is your, um, your companion. He's your sidekick. He's your co-pilot. And some people have a my buddy Jesus, where Jesus just kind of only exists to be your partner. You're really running things. You're kind of the one directing the ship, and my buddy Jesus is there just to kind of support you and be your cheerleader. And the problem with all of these Jesuses and a bunch of others that we could mentioned besides, is that none of them save. None of them save. And this is why the question that Jesus asks his disciples is utterly crucial. Matthew 16, 
Look at verse 13. Now, when Jesus came into the district of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples, who do people say that the Son of Man is? What are some of the false versions of me that you've heard of that are out there? And they said, verse 14, some say John the Baptist, others say Elijah, others Jeremiah or one of the prophets. And he said to them, but who do you say that I am? Simon Peter replied, you are the Christ, the son of the living God. And Jesus answered him, blessed are you, Simon Barjona, for flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my father who is in heaven. And I tell you, you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven, and whatever you bind on earth shall be bound in heaven, and whatever you loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. This is God's word. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the gift of your word. We ask that you would help us to pay attention um, to it, that that. If there's anything that I were to say that would distract or detract from your precious, sufficient word, that it would go in these ears, uh, in in one ear and out the other, but that your word would find purchase in our hearts, that we might treasure your son as we all. We pray these things in his name, the name of Christ Jesus. Amen. Now, we live in a day where people treat the church about like they treat Jesus. They find the church helpful in times of more obvious need, but optional, non-integral, generally sort of an add-on to their life. Churches for special occasions. Churches for when we feel like it. Churches when there's something else that's not interfering. This kind of runs parallel to the concept, the rise of the phrase, Um, particularly in the Western world, um, spiritual but not religious. We have a rise of spirituality, in fact, while we see a decline in church membership and church attendance. There's an increase in people who say, I'm spiritual. I like spiritual things. So people are not uninterested in spiritual things. They're just uninterested in the church, in Christianity. When you really get down to it and talk to people who say that they're spiritual but not religious. So before I moved to Kansas City, Missouri, um, nine years ago, I pastored a church in Vermont in the Northeast United States. And Vermont, I don't know if if you know anything about Vermont, it's one of the six New England states. The six New England states rank at the top of the least church states in the nation. And when I was there, Vermont was the number one unchurched state in the whole country. But invariably, as I would you know, go around town, run errands, go get my hair cut, whatever. I would talk to people and they'd find out I was a pastor. And, you know, I I don't recall ever meeting a Christian in any of these um, encounters, but I I remember meeting a whole lot of spiritual people. People would say, ah, well, you know, I don't really go to church. I'm not really all that interested in church, but I'm, I'm a spiritual person. I do like spirituality. And I would say, oh, really? Well, like, tell me what that means. And then they would really kind of struggle to kind of define it. They couldn't really explain actually what it means to be spiritual. And what I discovered after a few years of ministry there talking to spiritual but not religious people um, is that for most of them, not all of them, but for most of them, what that meant was they rarely ever even think about spiritual things except when someone like me asks them about it. And then they don't want to seem, you know, totally off, off base or, you know, they want to be able to make conversation Spiritual but not religious means I like to sometimes think spiritual thoughts, but I don't really do anything about them, or I don't do anything with them. So the church has become just one of many options in the American's personal spiritual journey. They could take it or leave it. And in fact, there's more and more people who identify as Christian who could take or leave church. But this is not an option that the New Testament holds out to us. In fact, the Bible shows us nothing of discipleship that's done on one's own, independent from a local church. There really is no fruitful solo Christianity. We need each other and we need the body of Christ. And so it's as much for our benefit as for the glory of Christ that Jesus makes Peter's 
personal confession into a manifesto, a manifesto about the collective confession of believers together. We're going to key in on just one verse. We'll look at the rest of that passage that we read for context, but verse 18 is where we're really just going to dial in. I tell you, you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. Now, remember that Peter's given name is Simon. In fact, Jesus refers to him as Simon Barjona. That just means son of Jonah. So um, Simon Peter's father's name was Jonah. And Jesus looks at Simon here and he renames him. He gives him the name Peter. This is something we see throughout the scriptures, name changing often by God himself. It usually denotes somebody's turning point in the faith. So in the Old Testament, Abram, you probably remember, Abram becomes Abraham, and Sarai becomes Sarah, and Jacob becomes Israel. And here, Simon Barjona becomes Peter, which comes from the Greek word Petros, or Petra, which means rock. I'm gonna come back to that interesting nickname in a moment, but what is most important here is that Simon is nicknamed by Jesus primarily because Jesus has a way of making sure that we understand that he is in control. He's not the hippie peasant philosopher you can take or leave. Jesus upholds the universe, Hebrews 1.3 says, by the word of his power. He is sovereign. He is God in the flesh. So he owns us and he owns everything else. So when Jesus comes along and says, hey, what's your name? And you say one thing and he says, no, nah, it's something else. Guess what? You got a new name. Whatever he says your name is, that's your name. And Jesus is making Peter his own. By renaming him, he's saying, you belong to me. But the theological development that Jesus makes in this renaming is just as important. It's not that Jesus is walking around going, you know what, I don't like the name Jared, I'm just gonna call you Hollister. Wait, what is that? Just, that's not in the script, that just came to the top of my brain, right? Like he's just making things up. No, 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 there's a meaning behind it. He wants you to, to have some kind of weight there. He says, I'm gonna call you the rock. And on this rock, I'm going to build my church. Now, notice that he, he says, I'm going to build my church. He doesn't say, on you, I will build your reputation. Or I will build your legacy. Or I will build your self-esteem. Or anything else. He doesn't even say, I'm going to build your church. He says, I will build something that belongs to me, and that is my church. So the first thing we see in this passage is that what Christ builds is a church. If you're a note taker, this is the very first point. What Christ builds is a church. Not a parachurch, not a charity, not a religious organization, but a church. This is very important, young people. He's not building a youth group. He's not building a campus ministry. I, I, I teach at a seminary in Bible college. He's not building a seminary or Bible college. He's not building an online movement or any kind of spiritual movement other than the church. That's what he is committed to building. The gates of hell will prevail against everything else. It doesn't mean any of those things are bad or that they're not useful. It just means that what Christ has said will withstand the gates of hell is the church. Now this is really important because you're at a very vulnerable stage. Evangelical Christianity is, is still looking at, after years and years and years, we are still looking at a 70% dropout rate of those raised in the church who leave the church once they graduate high school. 70%. If we just put that in this room, 70% of those in this room 
No matter how committed you think you are to the church because of your commitment to youth group or Sunday school or your mom and dad bring you every week, whatever it is, 70% of you, once you get out into college and maybe a little bit beyond, decide, you know what, doesn't really fit in with what I want to do with my life. And you're gone. It's important now to decide what is Christ building? What do I want to make a purpose of my life? What do I want to invest in that has eternal resonance? Youth group, youth ministry, college group, college ministry, those things are great for the times and the seasons that we're in them. But what is eternal is the church. And if your commitment is just to youth group or your commitment is just to what mom and dad say you gotta do, You're not committing to what lasts forever. The church is God's plan A, and there is no plan B. Theologically speaking, what God has done in Christ to unite people of both sexes and of every tongue, tribe, race, and nation is a beautiful facet of the gospel itself. And to deny participation in the fullness of a local church is in effect to deny the gospel. To say, for instance, I I want Jesus as my personal Lord and Savior, but you know what, I could take or leave the church. It's like saying, I only want 70% of the good news. I don't really want the whole thing. If we could just get how important I think this inclusion in the church actually is, it might would change our perspective on just how special, just how unique, just how eternal and life-giving participation in the church is. Sometimes it means actually dwelling a little bit on our sense of exclusion, what it means to be outside of the church. And one of my favorite illustrations of this comes from the Old Testament, actually. This is um, uh, a pastor by the name of John Phillips. And he tells a little fictional story about a man from Moab. And it's based on just sort of like the temple system of the Old Testament. So I'm just going to read you this little story, if that's okay. Phillips says, imagine a Moabite of old gazing down upon the tents and tabernacle of Israel from some lofty mountain height. Attracted by what he sees, he descends to the plain and he makes his way toward the sacred enclosure surrounding the tabernacle. It's a high wall of dazzling linen which reaches over his head. He walks around it until he comes to the gate where he sees a man. May I go in there, he asks, pointing through the gate to where the bustle of activity in the tabernacle's outer court can be seen. Who are you, demands the man suspiciously, because any Israelite would know that he could go in there. I'm a man from Moab. The stranger replies, well, says the man at the gate, I'm very sorry, you cannot go in there. It's not for you. The law of Moses has banned the Moabite from any part in the worship of Israel until his 10th generation. The Moabite looks sad. Well, what would I have to do to go in there, he insists. Well, you'd have to be born again, replies the gatekeeper. You'd have to be born an Israelite. You would need to be born of the tribe of Judah, perhaps, or the tribe of Benjamin or Dan. Says the Moabite, I wish I had been born an Israelite of one of the tribes of Israel. As he looks more closely, he sees one of the priests having offered a sacrifice at the brazen altar and cleansed himself at the brazen laver and go on into the tabernacle's interior. What's in there? Asks the Moabite. Inside the main building, I mean. Oh, says the gatekeeper, that's the tabernacle itself. Inside there is a room containing a lampstand, a table, and an altar of gold. The man you saw was a priest. He will trim the lamp. He will eat of the bread upon the table. He will burn incense to the living God upon the golden altar. Ah, sighs the man of Moab. I wish I were an Israelite so that I could do that. I should love to worship God in that holy place and help to trim the lamp to offer him some incense and to eat at that table. Oh, no, says the man at the gate. Even I could not do that. To worship in the holy place, one must be not only born an Israelite, one must be born of the tribe of Levi and of the family of Aaron. The man from Moab sighs again. I wish, he says, I wish I had been born of of Israel, of the tribe of Levi, the family of Aaron. Gazing wistfully at the closed tabernacle door, he says, what else is in there? 
Well, there's a veil, replies his informant. It's a beautiful veil, I'm told. It divides the tabernacle in two. Beyond the veil is what we call the most holy place, the holy of holies. The Moabite is more interested than ever. What's in the holy of holies, he asks. There's a sacred chest in there called the Ark of the Covenant, answers the gatekeeper. It contains certain holy memorials of our past. Its top is made of gold, and we call that the mercy seat because God sits there between the cherubim. Do you see that pillar of cloud hovering over the tabernacle? That's the Shekinah glory cloud. It comes to rest on the mercy seat. And again, a look of longing shadows the face of the man from Moab. Oh, he says, if only I were a priest. I should love to go into the Holy of Holies and there gaze upon God and worship him there in the beauty of holiness. Oh no, says the man at the gate. You couldn't do that even if you were a priest. To enter into the most holy place, you would have to be the high priest of Israel. Only he can go in there, nobody else, only he. The Moabite's heart yearns once more. Oh, he cries, if only I had been born an Israelite of the tribe of Levi, of the family of Aaron. If only I had been born the high priest, I would go in there every day. I would go in there three times a day. I would worship continually in the Holy of Holies. The gatekeeper looks at him again and once more shakes his head. Oh, no, you couldn't do that. Even the high priest of Israel can go in there only once a year. And then only after the most elaborate of preparations. And even then only for a very little while. Sadly, the Moabite turns away. He has no hope in all the world of ever entering there. But you and I know the rest of the story. And if we're to fast forward it through the centuries, we have something fascinating. The hope of glory, Jesus Christ who in his death tears that veil from top to bottom so you know it's done from the Lord because it begins at the top. This heavy curtain is ripped from top to bottom. And it's now not just that sinners can walk in, that those who were once excluded can now enter in, but the Holy of Holies comes out to us, comes out of the sacred place breaks down the dividing wall and makes one new person. This is how Paul writes about this in Ephesians chapter two. He says, but now in Christ Jesus, you who once were far off have been brought near by the blood of Christ. For he himself is our peace who has made us both one and he has broken down in his flesh the dividing wall of hostility by abolishing the law of commandments expressed in ordinances that he might create in himself one new man in place of the two, so making peace, and might reconcile us both to God in one body through the cross, thereby killing the hostility. And he came and preached peace to you who were far off and peace to those who were near. For through him we both have access in one spirit to the Father. So then you are no longer strangers and aliens, but you are fellow citizens and members of the household of God. Or as he puts it elsewhere, Paul, here there isn't Greek and Jew, circumcised, uncircumcised, barbarian, Scythian, slave and free, but Christ is all and in all. He has made one person in Christ out of every tongue, tribe, race, nation. All have access, none are excluded. That's the glory of the gospel. And when you withdraw from the church, you deny this reality. You look at that reality, the unity that is brought about through the blood of Christ and you say, eh, it's not that big a deal. What an offense that is to the good news of Jesus. Christ is not committed to building our personal brand, our personal legacy, our personal company. He is committed to building his church. Secondly, what Christ builds is all of grace. What Christ builds is all of grace. One thing I love about um, the experience of reading through the gospels is this. Do you ever get the impression from Jesus's interaction with the disciples that he's really after the cream of the crop? I find it oddly encouraging how dumb the disciples are. How at every stage they just 
don't seem to get it. When Jesus is being literal, they think he's being metaphorical. When Jesus is being metaphorical, they think he's being literal. Right up until the end, they're always three steps behind. I find that very encouraging. It means that Jesus has space for someone like me who can't get his act together. There's a time, um, you probably remember this, uh, where Jesus miraculously feeds 5,000 people. Remember, there's a whole huge crowd there, 5,000. And Jesus takes a little bit of fish and bread and he multiplies it miraculously and feeds 5,000 people. Do you remember actually that not long after that, there's another time where Jesus and the disciples are facing a crowd. It's a smaller crowd, still a big crowd, but it's about 4,000. So I'm not a math major, but 4,000 is smaller than 5,000, right? So fewer people... They have more bread and fish than they had with the crowd of 5,000. So if you're doing the algebra, okay, smaller crowd, more resources. And the disciples say, how are we going to feed all these people? Like, are you idiotic? Do you not remember what he just did? He just miraculously fed 5,000 people. And now you're looking at 4,000 and you're wondering how you're going to do it? Uh, Are they stupid? I mean, the answer is yes, kind of. Later, they're in a boat and Jesus starts teaching and he's being metaphorical. And he says, beware of the leaven, the yeast of the, the, you know, the Pharisees and beware of the leaven of Herod. And the disciples are like, he's talking about bread. Does he want a sandwich? How are we going to feed him? Where are we going to find food? Just so dumb. But at no point, at no point, and Jesus, you know, he corrects them, he'll rebuke them, what have you. But at no point does Jesus go, you know what? I really thought you guys would be a lot further along by now. You've had the best seminary education in the world. Year by year, every single day, with God in the flesh, side by side, and you still don't get it. I obviously picked the wrong disciples. He never says anything like that. You know what, I thought you were assets to the organization. Obviously didn't make the right choice. Let me go find somebody who's a little more on the ball. He never does it. And what's beautiful about that, it's funny, yes, but what's beautiful about it is they are us. And if you ever wonder, out of all of your mess ups and all of your sin, And all of your stupidity, if there's a day where Jesus says, you're just not worth it, it's not true. Look at the Gospels and see the good news. You never surprise Jesus with how you are. You might surprise other people. They had no idea you were like this. But Jesus knows exactly what you're like. He knows the things you're going to do before you do them. He says to Peter, I tell you, you are Peter. On this rock, I will build my church. And if you understand just what Jesus is doing here, it's almost laughable if you don't understand grace. Peter is maybe the most impetuous of all the disciples. I mean, it's a pretty close race. But Peter's the one who jumps out of boats without thinking. Peter chops off ears, right? Peter's like, he speaks without thinking. Peter's the most rash, he's the most impetuous, he's the most jumpy. And Jesus looks at him and goes, ah, you're a rock. Scholar N.T. Wright says that Jesus calling Peter a rock is like when we call a fat guy slim, you know? It's like the ironic nickname, you know? Or or tiny, right? This This is my pal Tiny, and we say, we call him Tiny because he's so big, right? That's what Jesus is kind of doing here with Peter. And yet this is a dynamic we see over and over in the scriptures that God calls sinners beloved. The grace of the gospel, it makes us more than we are. I think of Gideon in the Old Testament. He's laying low in the wine press, hiding because he's a coward. He's afraid of the Midianites. And he's scared. And the angel of the Lord comes up to the wine press and addresses him. And he says, hello there, mighty man of valor. Gideon, a mighty man of valor, why would he say that? Or Peter, in his, one of his epistles later in the, in the New Testament, he said, he's saying to Christian 
women that you're a daughter of Sarah if you don't fear anything terrifying, if you're not scared of anything. And when you think of Sarah in the Old Testament, like she's scared of all kinds of stuff. How are you a daughter of Sarah if you're not afraid when Sarah was always afraid? It's the same concept here to call Peter a rock. It's the revisionist history of the gospel that frail people like you and me would be called, for instance, in Romans chapter eight, more than conquerors. Or, to get to the heart of the gospel, that sinners would be called holy. It's all of grace. And what's so wonderful about the doctrine of grace is that it reminds us that we need not be strong to receive the strength of Christ, we just need to be trusting. The church of Christ is built by grace alone. And this is, by the way, um, why I don't think, this is a little theological rabbit trail, and I'll I'll be quick because I know I'm running out of time here. Matthew 16, 18, um, I, I, I grew up in a church tradition that would say Peter's not the rock, his confession is the rock. And what they're trying to do is avoid the Roman Catholic view that Peter is like the first pope and the church is built upon the, the papacy, on the, on the succession of popes and all those sorts of things. And you don't have to believe that to think that Jesus is talking about building the church on, on, on Peter here. To go where the Roman Catholics go, you have to build in a whole lot of heretical assumptions into the understanding of the passage. But you don't have to believe that to see that Peter is the rock here because of the irony that Peter is a sinner. It's it's a parallel concept to what Paul develops in Ephesians 5. He says that in him, in Christ, you also are being built together into a dwelling place for God by the Spirit. In, in, In other words, yeah, Peter's a rock, but you're the rocks too. Is the church being built upon sinners? Yes, sinners who confess Christ as Lord and as their only hope for escaping hell and conquering death. With Christ as the chief cornerstone, the church is being made up of all kinds of sinners all over the world. Anyone and everyone who is able to confess that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God, he builds his church up out of the redeemed. This is simply another way of saying that you and I are part of the body of Christ. If you find it somehow offensive or heretical to say that we are rocks in this building that Jesus is making, think about what it means to be a part of his body. Isn't it, wouldn't it be more heretical to say you're Jesus' arm or hand or foot? But that's symbolism that the New Testament also uses. Well, how can the Bible say this? How can Jesus say this? How can he say he's building his church on quote unquote rocks like Simon Peter and rocks like you and me? It's because anyone who confesses with their mouth that Jesus is Lord and believes in their heart that God has raised him from the dead is an unconquerable, unstoppable person. Narratively, what I find stirring is what Jesus in this moment knows lays ahead and we'll finish with this little reminder. Peter is the rock here, but Peter has a lot more shifting to do. Peter makes a similar confession in John chapter six. It's the feeding of the 5,000. If you keep reading in that story, after the crowd's miraculously fed, Jesus begins to teach. And he teaches some really hard things. He, you know, hippie peasant philosopher, Jesus says, if you really want to live, right, you got your bellies full now with the fish sandwiches, but if you really want to live forever, you have to eat my flesh and drink my blood. And the whole crowd says, what is he talking about? That's, that's crazy. It's offensive. It's, it's too hard a saying. Look, we need you to live. We have to feast on you to live. And they all leave. The whole crowd, they all leave. And at the end, it's just Jesus and his closest disciples. And Jesus turns to them and says, you guys want to leave too? He's given them an out. And Peter, the rock, he says, Jesus, where would we go? Where would we go? Only you have the words of life. It's a great big shining moment, isn't it? 
Peter, he's being very much a rock. Well, Peter has a place to go because later as things get real and Jesus is now being betrayed and arrested and tortured and crucified, Peter is doing exactly what Jesus says he'll do. Jesus says, you will deny me three times. Peter says, I'll never do that. I'm the rock. You said so. Remember, it wasn't John who said, where would we go? Only you have the words of life. That was me. And yet, and Peter does exactly that. He denies Jesus. And then Jesus is crucified and dead and buried. And then, on the third day, Christ rises again. And the disciples are, <laughs> their minds are turning. Wait a minute. The thing we thought was metaphorical, maybe that's literal. All that stuff he talked about, coming back from the dead, rising the dead, build, you know, take this thing down, I'll build it back up again. He really meant that, he's coming back. And they're excited and they're scared and they're trying to figure it out. Peter, you have to think, put yourself in Peter's shoes. Peter's gotta be thinking, this is amazing, he's coming back, but also, the last thing I did before he died was deny him three times. And if you're Peter, you're remembering Jesus saying things like, if you deny me before men, I will deny you before the Father. You don't think Peter remembered that Bible verse? I bet he did. And so Jesus comes back, Peter, you know, he busts a move to get to that tomb to look inside. And it's empty. And the word has come back. This is what I find fascinating. The word comes back um, from the women and they say, uh, Jesus is back and he wants to see you guys, and also Peter. <laughs> they, like name, they name him specifically. He wants to see his disciples and Peter. And if you're Peter, like, wait, he said my name? Yeah, Peter, I don't know. Like we, he wants to see everybody, but he named you, Peter. He said he wants to see you. If you're Peter, you're scared, I think. Happy that your friend and the one that you think is the savior is alive, back from the grave, but probably also terrified. And so there's a moment, there's a moment of reunion. Do you remember they're on the beach? They're eating breakfast, probably bread and fish. And the, probably the disciples are like, where are we gonna get breakfast? You know, I don't know. Anyway, <laughs> they're eating breakfast. And Peter's just gotta be there like so nervous the whole time. And I think Jesus has a great sense of humor. So I think Jesus is probably like, hey, how you doing, Peter? Eating his fish biscuit, you know. You doing all right over there? <laughs> Dragging it out just a little bit. But Jesus isn't cruel. So they have a moment of reunion, and you probably remember that scene, where Jesus asked Peter, Peter, do you love me? And Peter says, oh, you know I love you, Lord. You know I love you. And Jesus asks him a second time, Peter, do you love me? Peter says, come on, it's me. You, you, know, you know I love you. And Jesus asks him a third time, Peter, do you love me? And by this time, I'm thinking Peter's brain is saying, please believe I love you. Please believe I love you. Please believe. I don't know what I will do if you don't believe I love you. He says, you know I love you. I, of course I love you. What is Jesus doing in the moment? Why would he ask him three times? Well, now, in between, like if, if you look at the passage, in between each of those questions, Jesus is telling them, you know, feed my lambs, tend my lambs. He's restoring Peter to the ministry, which is amazing. Um, but why would he ask him this three times? Why would he just take his answer? Well, some look at the Greek behind the language there. Jesus and Peter are using two different words for love. Jesus is saying, do you agape me? And Peter is saying, I phileo you. And agape me is like a sacrificial kind of love at its root. And phileo love is like a brotherly kind of love. So where we get the word Philadelphia from, city of brotherly love. Like phileo means a brotherly kind of love. And so the idea is that Jesus is saying, do you sacrificially love me? And Peter's saying, I love you like a friend or I love you like a brother. But a lot of scholars think there's really no distinction, like we shouldn't be making that distinction. There's no significance in the different, that John uses in his gospel, those different words synonymously. 
But even apart from that, does it make sense if you're Peter and you really want Jesus to believe you, that you love him, like you wanna be restored and Jesus is saying, do you really love me? Do you really think Peter would be like, well, you know, I kinda love you. That, that doesn't make sense to me. I think Peter desperately wants Jesus to believe that he loves him. The significance is in asking three times, why? Because Peter denied him three times. Why would that be significant? It tells us, it tells us that we cannot out the grace of God. That for as much as we can sin, Christ's blood will forgive us and wash us whiter than snow. He is a better savior than we are sinners. And you and I are really good sinners. So here's the takeaway. If you can confess with your mouth that Jesus Christ is Lord and believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead, if you will repent of all the fake Jesuses, all of the false Jesuses that may feel good for a little while or get you through what you need to get through for a little while, if you can repent of all of that and put your faith in Christ alone, it doesn't matter what you've done, who you are, where you came from, his love is for you and you are an unstoppable, unconquerable person. That's the good news. And we'll keep teasing that out as we go, let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you for the gift of your good news. We thank you for the gift of your church, help us to know that the good news that saves us into personal relationship with you saves us into your son's body. And to be a part of your son's body is to be an uncon unconquerable, unstoppable person. We thank you for Christ Jesus. Help us to see his glory that we might be changed by it. And it's in his name we pray these things. Amen.